Hey there, Dave Flytus, Can I Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. Back again. Well, the uh, new segment went over big. I got a lot of comments about it. And here we go again with uh, one new story this week. And uh, it's near and dear to my heart. And it de deals with bears. So, uh, on July 6th, in Ovando, Montana, a teacher, retired, I'm sorry, retired nurse vacationing with some friends, was camping in a campground in the city of Ovando, Montana. And in the middle of the night, bear came in, grizzly bear. It had come in before, earlier in the evening. Um, the people were intense. This one woman sprayed the bear, apparently. Other people had sprayed the bear earlier. It didn't, didn't matter. It came back, attacked, and killed the woman. There was some thought that maybe there was some food in her tent at some point and that she had taken it out earlier. It's a little unclear what happened. The bear came back to a chicken coop in the city at another residence and had been there in the weeks earlier. Uh, fishing game rangers were there and they killed the bear. Uh, they did an autopsy on there. They did a necropsy on the bear and they found human remains inside. They killed the right bear. Now, that is a big moment in my world for grizzly bears. Here's why. Grizzly bears are isolation type creatures. They don't like people. They don't like being around people. And they will find areas away from people to live. That's just the way they are. And for a grizzly bear to come into a city means that it's getting pushed out of its habitat because of a lack of food or a lack of territory that probably isn't claimed by a alpha bear. Now, it's a bad sign for the grizzlies. There's been a lot of talk in Montana in the last few years about starting up a grizzly hunt because we're starting to reach that area of saturation for bears in some people's minds. Now, what happened just within the last week and a half, there was another attack by a grizzly bear. And this is uh, in an area near Enis, E-N-N-I-S. Happened at 8.30 p.m. Two people were off trail at 8.30 at in the early evening, it's still light out here at 8.30, but that's the time bears start moving, wildlife starts moving. They were out hiking off trail with a dog, ran into a mama bear and some cubs, and she didn't like them being there, and she attacked them. They were able to walk out on their own, and they survived. Now, I've commented about bears before. Some of the comments I see coming back are from people who obviously have no idea who what a grizzly bear is like. So first of all, they're one of the smartest animals in the woods, by far. They're stealthy. They're smart. They could be sitting four feet off the trail contemplating killing you, and you would never have known, and you could have walked by without ever seeing them. That's how scary it is. They could come up on you and you may not even hear them. They may charge you from the front, run away, and you, th you think, oh, I'll keep my eye over here. And they may come all the way around the back and come at you from a different angle. True story. And if you talk to uh, guides or outfitters, they'll tell you they scare them. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Angie and I have been in some areas up here where the foliage is so thick going into some lakes. We hiked into a lake last summer about five, six miles, do some fishing. And right around us, it was probably maybe a foot wider than my shoulders. And the foliage was thick. You couldn't see a foot into it. And it went up maybe seven or eight feet. I had the lead and I had my shotgun out pointed right down the trail because if some if a bear jumps out on you and decides to come at you, you don't have any time to deploy bear spray. Sorry, you just don't. Because that bear is making a decision right then and there that you're gonna be the meal. 
the best gun in the woods for that shotgun alternating slugs and double lot and that's exactly what uh, wildlife officials use when they go in on bears so and angie behind me had spray and was her head was on a rotating scale looking behind her i just had the front and we're making a lot of noise and that's what's well, one of the keys in the woods if you come from an area where you don't have a lot of bears you, you're real stealthy because you want to see and you're quiet and you want to see wildlife not in bear territory make a lot of noise and you don't see a lot of wildlife because you're making all this noise but you're saving your life probably and I've been out with, since I've been here, I've been out with uh, some guides that I knew. And I've learned a lot from them about how to, how to make your way in the woods and stay safe. Uh, up in Glacier, lots of bears, lots of bears. And there's a good chance you're going to see one. And I've said this before. If you're going to go to Grazer, uh, Glacier, watch the documentary, The Night of the Grizzly. Your opinion about bears will change forever. All right. So that's the end of the 411 news for this week. And now we go on to your letters. And there are some doozies this week. All right. Says Dave, feel compelled to write you this letter to say thank you for doing what you are doing with your channel. Bringing light to the untold stories of the missing is fascinating to me, and that alone draws me back to your work. But what you're doing as a man and a father and sharing your vulnerabilities, thoughts, emotions, and grief of Ben's passing is really remarkable. In moving forward publicly with your healing, you have also helped so many more countless people, many more than you realize who are experiencing and dealing with similar issues. I'm one of them. What you're doing is making a difference, a big difference. After listening to the countless letters from your subscribers, I'm one of many who you have helped just by speaking out and discussing your experience openly and honestly. I've watched all your videos and cried and grieved along with you about the loss of your son. Ben and the others also suffering similar circumstances who have shared their stories. It truly breaks my heart and my prayers are with you. In July, I'll change the year 2015 my daughter abruptly started down a path of very serious self-harm she was diagnosed with social anxiety and depression over the course of last summer we were in the emergency room twice and i thought we had lost her one night i'm happy to say that with counseling and a lot of hard work and with a team of professionals and family support behind her she's in a much better spot thankfully well i'm telling you stay close to that girl you know, really close. Your videos truly helped me deal with her situation with a more open approach. I come from the school of just snap out of it, that everything is just in your head, shake it off. You helped me to realize that people truly have issues and it's just not a weak mindset. To seek help from professionals and probably most important, pay attention to small details and the subtle warning signs. Your work is making a difference. It's important and it matters. Thanks again from all of us. Keep up the good fight. Don't stop seeking the truth. Appreciate that. Thank you. Now, I'll give you some uh, feedback. This last couple weeks, I've had some pretty nasty emails from people saying, hey, is this turning into the psychology channel? Uh, uh, or is this just now the suicide channel? Or I, I am truly astounded at people's crap attitudes towards the public and their need to impart on me to entertain them to their needs. This channel has evolved. I'll tell you that. And uh, when Ben first established it, it was about missing people and educating the public, which I am doing and I will continue to do. But part of that evolution is understanding need and understanding our place in this world. I can tell you that 
I never imagined in a thousand years I'd be sitting here talking to you about what I'm explaining right now. Ever, never. Understanding the human mind and human needs and what COVID has done to our culture and the number of people that are suffering severe mental health issues is profound in my book. I can't believe it. There are so few people in my community that even understand how bad it is. And I talk about it all the time around. Now my grief counselor, oh boy, she knows. She tells me every week what's the updates and how bad it is. And I guess the press doesn't want to talk about this and even acknowledge that people are having health issues, mental health issues. Don't worry, folks. We're going to keep talking about it. And we're going to talk about little things that we can do to help each other, little things you can do to help yourself. Um, the the dirty comments that expect me to just sit here and spew out entertainment for people. I'm not going to I'm not going to listen to it. And I'm not going to be influenced by people who have wants while others have needs. So, enough about that. On to another letter. Uh, I would suggest that you get your soda, water, iced tea, a pastry, a cookie, get into a big comfortable chair and sit down because this one is a good one. And it's gonna be a little bit long. So if you're driving, turn the radio up, sit back in the seat, pay attention to your drive, but you're gonna like this story, it's pretty interesting. Dave, I was listening to your latest upload on the YouTube machine and I grew up in the area of Australia that you've talked about. I visited Healesville regularly and camped around the region extensively, usually, usually solo, sometimes with a partner. Your case reminded me of my own experience around that region, and it's a long story. But if you have time and inclination to read it, here it is. Well, here we go. Back in 2011, I was fully committed to spending all free time I had in the woods. Luckily for me, I also had a boyfriend who felt exactly the same. We, were, we would go bush bear grill style, taking nothing but a backpack and our long bows, tramp into the woods, build a shelter, harvest berries to eat, and leaves for tea, and spend weekends exploring Victoria's bushland. That sounds like heaven to me. I've done a little of that when I was out in Australia in the Blue Mountains. Love it. One Friday night, I surprised my partner when he got home from work by having the van packed and told him we were spending the weekend at Bunyip, B-U-N-Y-I-P State Forest, which we'd never visited before. He was thrilled, and we jumped into my little Toyota Town Ace van, we don't have those in the U.S. that I know of, and set the directions into my phone's GPS. Now, for all you non-Aussies, a bunnyip, B-U-N-Y-I-P, in Australian lore, is a mythical creature heralding back to our ancient indigenous times. Our indigenous were so fearful of them as to not talk about them or include descriptions in their tribal stories. But as this doesn't really have relevance to my story, I'll leave that as an interesting footnote. Hmm. It was a horrendous night to go camping, lashing rain about seven degrees Celsius, but he was army trained and I wasn't phased by the inclement weather, so we really didn't mind. I was driving as he only had a motorcycle license and the further we went into the woods we drove, the worse the roads got. I was starting to feel a bit stressed from the concentration needed, trying to see through the waterfall cascading down the windshield and my van's supremely inadequate high beams lighting the way. My headlights may as well have been a couple of candles for all the light they threw. My GPS got us into the Bunyip State Forest, but couldn't pinpoint any camping sites. So we drove around the forest, randomly 
choosing which fork in the road to take, trying to spot signs at a campsite which the website had said was there. The dirt tracks were very muddy and washed with water. So friends in the US, a dirt track in Australia is a dirt road or maybe a logging road in the US, <laughs> trying to translate here. And I was starting to think this might have been a mistake. My van was the opposite of a four wheel drive as we were slipping all over the place. And the responsibility of get us, getting us in and out safely sat quite heavily in my shoulders and I couldn't turn the wheel over to my partner. Finally, there looked to be a sort of a clearing up ahead and through the rain, I spotted the wood building with a tin roof that was typical for long drop bathrooms in the Aussie bush. About 100 meters away, we could also see a massive bonfire holding its own against the now pattering rain. And we both breathed a sigh of relief that we seemed to have found a campsite. As we turned a slight corner to come into the site, I stepped on the brake suddenly and we came to a stop in a slick sliding rush. There in the middle of the road, backlit by the bonfire, front lit by my soft yellow high beams, was a group of men frozen in tableau, T-A-B-L-E-A-U. Took about 10 seconds for my brain to make sense of what I was seeing. The fogged up windshield and rain didn't help much either. There were three men standing silent and still on the road like the proverbial deer in the headlights, holding between them the inert body of another man who looked to not have many clothes on. His chest and feet were bare and he hung limply in the grip of the men who held him off the muddy ground. Whether he was asleep, passed out drunk or other, we couldn't tell, but we both froze in silence in the stationary van, not sure how to proceed or if we should offer to help. So <laughs> stop there for a second. I've been in a similar position one other time and as you guys know, I always carry a gun. You know, being on the SWAT team, practicing every day for years with it, I, I feel like I'm pretty proficient with it. And this one time, this person came up to the driver's side when I was really deep into the woods. And I pulled my gun out and I put it, he couldn't see it, it was under my coat and it was pointed right at him in case he pulled a knife or he pulled a gun. I was gonna, gonna definitely get the drop on the guy, but he never saw what I was doing. I was just sitting there talking to him and it was a it was a bit freaky he uh kind of reminded me of a of a marijuana grower deep in the woods that was coming out to warn me to stay away and uh he was he was nice kind of direct yeah you need to go back because the road gets really bad up here okay i'll go back thanks and i did go back because i wasn't going to camp around with this guy walking around so I know in Australia you can't have guns like that, but in the U.S. thankfully we can. So going on, without turning my head, I talked out the side of my mouth asking Mika, my boyfriend, what we should do. He was silent, just staring ahead like I was. After what was probably 20 seconds, the, mean, the men seemed to deliberate and another man appeared off the road from the bush where we hadn't seen him and he talked briefly with his companions before turning toward us and walking our way. As he strolled nonchalantly through the mud in a line to the van, the others resettled their grips on the limp man and continued carrying him off the road into the bush, away from the fire. Now, Mika was army trained, a black belt in Muay Thai, practiced in Jiu Jitsu, and was a shaved headed hulk of a guy all lean muscle and towering strength. But when I frantic frantically looked at him for advice on what we should do, he had no answer. Oh, come on, Mika. <laughs> come on, man. Man up, buddy. I surreptitiously used my hand that was not on the steering wheel to search around for my hunting knife before remembering it was in the back of the van. I locked onto my small pocket knife instead. Oh, that's, that'll really help pulling it out of my cargo pants pocket and placing it between my legs in my lap. 
While my frantic search was going on, I never, I never took my eyes off this rain-muddied figure just casually sauntering up to my driver's window like he hadn't a care in the world. He reached my window and made the universal gesture for me to roll it down so we could talk. I opened it a crack, partly in fear, partly because it was still raining, and stared at him without expression, waiting to hear what he had to say. He opened with, Good day, what are you guys doing here? in one of those typically country Aussie accents. I answered that my partner and I were looking for a place to camp, that I could see it was crowded here. So we will look else, somewhere else? He just looked at me for a while, saying nothing while I was contemplating how to get away from this bizarre experience as quickly as possible. Eventually he spoke again, after apparently deciding something and told me, well, there's a great campsite up the road, just turn left at the next fork and take the first right after 50 meters. You'll be happy there. He waited for me to tell him, sure, that sounded great, thanks. Then after another look around the inside of the cab of the van, he turned away, heading to the patch of bush where his friends had disappeared. Part of me was scared but confused because it seemed we were all comfortable not addressing this real and strange fact that we had just busted him and his mates dragging a body off into the bush. He offered no explanation and I really didn't want to ask him for obvious reasons. I was just happy that he was gone we could drive away from the scene as quickly as my van could take us on these sloppy tracks. Yeah. As I started urging the van forward, Mika and I started digesting what just happened. He was a lot calmer than I was, thinking that it could have been a practical joke they were playing on a drunk friend or something innocuous like that. I was happy for that to be the case, but the situation still didn't seem that clear cut to me. If that was the scenario, wouldn't the spokesman tell us that, laughing about it? Wouldn't he also seem a bit inebriated himself? He was stone cold sober. I could tell from his clear eyes and speech. But I decided to go with what Mika believed as it was a more reassuring package of events. And when Mika said we should take their directions to the campsite, I agreed and took the left turn at the fork, slowed down to make a right turn 50 meters ahead as the man suggested. Bad decision. As I took the right hand turn and my feeble headlights shone down the track, I immediately knew we'd made a mistake. I told you. The four wheel drive track dropped sharply downhill, running through muddy water and way too steep for my van. I was fully committed though, as there was no time or room to reverse or turn away. I have no idea how I managed to keep the van on the track as we slid and slewed downward at an angle that kept increasing. It only lasted 50 meters or so before we hit a dead end, thankfully on a flat patch. There were trees stacked across the rest of the track and it would be impossible to go any further. I kept the engine running and was breathing heavily from the adrenaline and turned to Mika who finally conceded that maybe that guy didn't have our best interests in mind. Ah, uh, yeah. At this point, all my suppressed fear returned, as would of mine, and all sorts of horrible scenarios were going through my head. What if they purposely sent us here so that we'd roll the van? What if they just wanted to send us somewhere so we could get stuck so they could return for us? I was grimly frustrated that Mika didn't seem to take it seriously as I was. Maybe he didn't realize because he only drove a motorbike how obvious it was that it was a setup to send us down this track. Also, he had none of the pressure of having to deal with us getting out of here. He was relying on me to do it. I pulled the driver's rank and told him that's it, we are leaving and we are leaving this forest and we are going home, if I could get us there. The flat space we were in was tiny, not much bigger than my van, surrounded by bush and the downed trees. At least by now the rain had stopped and that was a huge relief so I could see clearly out the windows. I proceeded to perform a ridiculous 50 point turn, roll forward a few inches, reverse at an angle, repeat it 50 times until we were finally facing back up the road we had come down. I churned the ground underneath to a sloppy mess at this stage, but it saw enough rocks cemented in the ground to give us a bit of traction to start navigating up the steep incline. By applying my handbrake, lots of over revving in my first gear and copious amounts of sweat, we reached the top of the track. I never ever want to do something that scary again. I turned right following the road away from the campsite and the men. And as we had no map, we spent an hour driving randomly around the bush until we popped out onto a proper road, found a highway, and returned home. After we got home around, we got home after midnight, and I was all for calling the police 
and reporting what we had seen. Mika talked me out of it though, saying nothing had really happened and we still weren't sure what we had seen. If something like this had happened nowadays, I would report it immediately, but I was younger and trusted Mika's advice and even felt a bit foolish for letting the events get so large and scary in my mind. I did keep an eye on the newspapers, looking out for anything that might link to that night, but saw nothing, and eventually it became just another camping story. To this day, though, I don't set off to go camping at night in the rain anymore. Anyway, I obviously have no idea if this is related to any of the cases you know in that region, but I think it was interesting and it might be relevant. Who knows? Thanks. Okay. It's a good story. I liked it. Number one rule. Before you get into the forest, make sure, number one, you have a full gas tank. Remember she said they drove around at night for an hour trying to find their way out. If it's a cold night, snowy night, you don't want to get stuck out there without gas and heat. Make sure you have gas. I don't know why her GPS on her phone didn't work to get her out because she talked about that earlier. And I don't, I don't quite understand why they didn't call the police. Many people are reluctant to call the police even though they think maybe I should. If you have a slight inclination, you should call the police. We would want to know. I'm sure the officer in that area would have wanted to know. Uh, I think the mother of the guy who's hanging limp between his buddies would have wanted the police to go out and find out what's going on. But anyhow, thanks. Good story. Okay. That's another good one too. What, is, what a busy week I have. Uh, this is how my story began. I live in California right now, in North Hollywood. I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio. My story actually begins in Columbus at Ohio State in September of 73. I was 16 and a freshman. In 73, I had never heard of the Bermuda Triangle. I was only 16, although well-traveled, but never out of the country. For my first week at Ohio State, strange things were happening around campus. I believed in UFOs, but never actually saw any until my first semester at OSU. I lived in one of two 23-story co-ed dorms. My dorm was named Morrill Tower, and I lived on the 17th floor. The other was Lincoln Tower. They were the only co-ed dorms on campus at the time. <laughs> when I went to Berkeley, I lived in the only co-ed dorms on campus and everything about our dorms were co-ed. When you went to take a shower, the person in the next shower over might have been a girl, might have been a guy. The bathrooms were co-ed, everything was co-ed. And I, can't, I remember coming back and telling my mom about it and she said, what? And the girls let that happen? So, anyhow. From the beginning, we saw strange lights outside our dorms. It wasn't only me and my roommates, but practically all the students in both dorms. Hundreds had seen them. It was a nightly phenomenon. At first, we thought it might be helicopters, but we found out from our research it was not. The lights were very bright and would surround the two towers and disappear suddenly while we were all watching. It wasn't spooky because it was so intriguing. We never felt in danger of the objects. It gave us something to talk about and gave camaraderie to the people who may never have said a word to each other. It certainly broke the ice for those of us in Morrell and Lincoln Towers. There was also a lamppost on campus that everyone saw at night that the light would turn red as you passed. And when you turned back, it'd be normal again. The lamp was spooky and most people ran past it to avoid looking at it. Well, I was always adventurous and wanted to do something really exciting for Christmas 1973. I was athletic and wanted to do something physical too. I gave my parents two choices of one I wanted for the break. I had to let them choose because I was only 16 and they were paying for it. Smart. I could take 15 skydiving lessons for $35 a lesson or go to Andros Island with an international field studies on a two week scuba diving expedition for $235. My parents chose the scuba diving expedition, not because of the money, but because the ocean was closer to the ground. There were 17 of us driving from Columbus to Fort Lauderdale in a big van. I was the youngest and the only black student in the group. The adventure began. A lot of people don't know this. When I was 
13. Uh, I lived right near De Anza College in Cupertino. And De Anza was sponsoring uh, a Naui scuba diving course. I think it was 24 weeks long. And they said you had to be 14. Well, I lied about my age to get in. And uh, my folks said, oh, you know, you're not going to have a problem. You're a great swimmer. So they said, do it. And uh, most of the kids, the young people in the class were all students at the end. So it was fun. And uh, I can tell you that that was one of the best things I ever did in life. The reason being is it opened up so many venues of so many places. I have dove around the world and seen some absolutely gorgeous things. And uh, Naui really, really prepares you. That's N-A-U-I. Now he really prepares you and instills safety in your mind. So I dove with other people who are certified from other organizations and I could just tell that they weren't really skilled in certain areas or educated and that was kind of scary. But I like hearing diving stories. Anyhow, most of us were involved in the UFO sightings on campus, so there was a lot of talk about during our drive to Florida. We had a game going on about being followed by the UFOs. We kept looking up and pretending we saw the UFOs if we saw something a little out of the ordinary. We sure scared the students that weren't privy to our previous sightings on campus. Once we got to Florida, all hell broke loose. We broke down three times before we got to the airstrip in Fort Lauderdale. That's a hint. Someone's trying to tell you something. We were stranded three times. We got motel rooms, but it was hard because of me being black and all. We broke down in Ocala, Hollywood, in Fort Lauder Lauderdale. There was no rhyme or reason for the van to break down. We would just stop while in motion. Parts would be missing out of the van or just disappeared. Never found the missing parts. We just blamed it on our UFOs. Now you must understand, none of us had heard of the Bermuda Triangle yet. We finally made it to a small private airfield in Fort Lauderdale. We met two others that were joining us on the expedition. A man and his 12-year-old son, David. Heck, it could have been me. Along with the pilot, I had never been on a plane before and I was not happy to see the relic we'd be on. It was a 28-seater storage shed. It didn't look as sturdy as the van that was left behind at another repair shop. I said my prayers and believed we'd get to Andros Island just fine. During the flight, when we were getting close to our destination, the pilot said, we are now flying over the Bermuda Triangle. What's that? I had to go up to the cockpit and ask what it was. I got more information than I wanted since we were over water and no land in sight. I was mad at the pilot that he made that little announcement while we were still airborne, especially since we were going to the same island where the Avengers disappeared from and would be staying in tents provided to, by us at the same naval base. We landed just fine. Everyone was excited. It was a shabby airport, but we were happy to be on the ground. Unfortunately, at the airport, we got some tragic news. The couple that was hosting us for the expedition was missing and feared dead. These two highly experienced divers went out diving a day or so before we got there and never returned. They owned a little restaurant on the island and we were supposed to spend a lot of time there for showers and meals. Well, that didn't happen. It was immediately closed down. We showered there once on our second day and the rest of the time we bathed in the blue holes or got our fresh water from there. Back to the first day and getting to camp. We were driven to our camp where an international field study guide was waiting. He went over the story again about our host's demise. We were sad, but still in awe of our surroundings. Stop there. So, you take a van that breaks down three times on the way to the airport. You arrive at the location and your hosts are missing. I don't know. I, I'd be thinking, that's enough of a message for me. I think I may be going home. But <laughs> you're young and you're adventurous. We're going to be living in nine big army tents and an abandoned schoolhouse was our storage, meeting, greeting, and eating place. We had to go through complete wilderness with no roads to get to our campsite. The ocean was in front of us and the woods behind us. Way, way back in the woods was an outhouse. It was paradise. Oh, <laughs> really? We had three heavy duty trap trucks for our transportation and we were ready for our island adventure. This was not a tourist attraction, but a real tough as nails adventure. There were only four or five girls and the rest were boys. The girls did not scuba dive, but all the guys did except David. 
I was closest to David's age, so we became fast pals and confidants. From day one, we had to take all three trucks out with us. Every time we went out, a truck broke down, sometimes two. Parts would suddenly come up missing from under the hood while the truck was in motion. We broke down every day for two weeks. We had to have three trucks now with us at all times. We were so far off the beaten track, we may have never found, we may have never been found unless we prepared for the breakdowns. The native islanders kept telling us we were being attacked by the Chick Charneys. There are three fingered leprechauns that cause chaos and havoc. We are, of course, had a running joke about the Chick Charneys because of our daily misfortune. Because of our youth, we never gave in. We all believed in a higher power for our protection. Our faith played an important role on our second day on the island. I'm sorry for hopping around my story, but I'm trying to tell it as I remember. Day two, the guys were going out for their first dive. Me and the girls, along with David, were going snorkeling on a deserted island in the Pigeon Keys. Yes, there weren't uninhabited islands in the Bahamas in 73. Before we took the boat out, we checked the guys' air tanks and made sure the tanks were full. Two boats dropped us off at our destinations. The water was choppy and the swells were high. We decided to come in from snorkeling early. On our way back, we saw our guys bobbing in the water, gasping for air. About 16 or 17 of our guys were out there in the water with no air in their tanks. They had all run out of air at the same time. Their tanks should not have been anywhere near empty. These were experienced divers. Even I knew how to check air pressure. They could have all died if we had not decided to come in early. There were a few great white sharks in the water. The water also had 10 to 15 foot swells and the guys were at least 10 to 15 miles from camp. We put all of them in our boat, which made at least 23 people aboard. We almost overturned in swells. One of our guys was close to having the bends and we thought we were going to have to take him to the naval base, but we got him through it. After a few nights on the island, we were cooking on the beach. beach. Actually, a local guy was cooking for us and we saw lights coming from the opposite direction of the airport. It was interesting because we were told no planes took off or landed after sundown because there were no lights on the runway. You have to understand, this was a one shack airport with no tower, just a strip. The locals said that they see lights all the time coming from that direction. It reminded us of OSU. At first, one light would come out and then return back into the trees. It came back, then there were two lights, and again it went back into the trees. And when they came back again, there were three. They were too agile to be planes because they could just stop and hover and move back into the trees without turning around, and way too fast to be helos. Suddenly, the lights started dancing. They would pick up an amazing amount of speed, like zero to 100 in a second. They darted around above us like pinballs. They would swoop down all over the water and hover just a few feet above the water and then shoot back above the trees in seconds. It was a real light show. It was so eerie because there was no sound at all. Before it ended, there were about five bright lights. This happened every night. We had an American pilot that hung out with us that lived on the island named Crazy Ed Brockton. At least that's what we called him because he would fly his plane daily, stone drunk, and was always clipping trees above our camp. He had no explanation for the lights either. We got used to the lights and the trucks breaking down. One night near the end of our two-week stay, there was a storm out at sea. We could see the lightning from far away. It was beautiful. We were 22 miles directly across from NASA, and you could never see individual lights from NASA, but just a haze of lights. We already had our light show that night, and then someone noticed that you could see individual lights over NASA. That's impossible. Suddenly, a huge light came from the direction heading straight for us. It was so bright, it lit up the trees around us. We finally got scared. One of the guys tried to take a picture, but his camera fell to pieces, literally. It takes 15 minutes to fly from NASA to Andros, and this thing was upon us in seconds. We were blinded by the light, too stupid to run. We were about to be moved down by something. We were about to be mowed down by something. It was right on us and suddenly disappeared. Someone just turned the light off. It was gone. We stood there in shock. We don't know what that was, but it didn't feel like a game anymore and we could not wait to go home. Our last night there, we decided to stay up late to watch that comet Kahootek. It was beautiful, as you could imagine. One of the best things about being on Andros was the sky. It was always so clear, an astronomer's dream. We got tired and went into our tents as we did every night. In our tent, the girls fell down on us. 
No reason for the full collapse. We didn't fix it either. We had to sleep on the beach in our sleeping bags. We knew how far the tide had come in because our tents were set up on the beach for two weeks. So we set up our sleeping bags far behind the tide line. No big deal. All the guys decided to sleep in their bags with us so we wouldn't be alone. Good move, guys. It was like a big sleepover. Sometime during the night, I heard water splashing around and it sounded really close. I slept with a sleeping bag over my head so nothing would crawl in with me. I looked out and saw nothing but ocean. I screamed and woke everyone up. We were all being washed out to sea over 20 people. That was about the first time the tide had come in this far. I'm so glad I'm a light sleeper. We could have all drowned being zipped in those sleeping bags. That was it. We got the message. We were not wanted. We stayed up all night and left in the early daybreak. No one talked about the Bermuda Triangle or our experiences while we were on the plane. We made it safely back to Florida. Our trip back to Ohio was uneventful and our van did not break down again. Yeah, they wanted you to leave. I did not go the next year, but David did, and he said it was even worse. A girl was almost killed, and they had to leave after only a few days. That was my experience in the Bermuda Triangle, as crazy as it was. I'm glad I was there. It was truly an adventure. Wow. <laughs> I can tell you that I spent time in the Bermuda Triangle many times, actually. Never had any freaky things happen. Uh, I was always there to dive, but I've read a lot of books about it. I think there's something odd that goes on there. don't really know what to say about it. But the lights in the sky, the lights dancing over the tops of the trees, I've heard thousands of those stories. And uh, when you ask the people, did the lights move with purpose? like there was intellect behind it. And I think almost 100% of the time that people say yes. So. Okay, on to the stories for this, this week. The first story has no name. And it's a recent case. August 7th, 2021, 9.30 p.m. Between Umberley, and Chittlehow Holt in the UK. And a six-year-old girl lived on a rural farm in a very rural area. And sometime before 9.30 at night, probably between 8.30 and 9.30, she disappeared from her room. Farmers looked all over, couldn't find her. And they called the UK police. They responded. First unit arriving at the scene was canine unit. And they gave the canine a scent. Canine took off, was finding no luck on finding the girl. Parents said that this had never happened before. They were stymied about what happened. So the police officer on scene calls for our helicopter assistance. And in the UK, they have something called the National Police Air Services. And they have 14 bases in the UK. A lot of people don't know this. And uh, in that rural area, if it would have been a rural area of America, the chances of getting a heat helicopter in there are almost zero. So kudos to UK for having a, a helicopter that was available. Well, it gets there. Remember, the canine can't find her and starts flying around. And a little more than a half a mile from her farm, they see something odd in a field. So let me, let me explain this for you. So, here's Ireland. This is the UK, here's London. This area happened right here. And from that red dot, which is where the residence was, or, to the ocean is about 10 miles. Water. Umberley, okay. And Chittleham Holt is right here. Somewhere in this area, they never gave the address. They never gave the name of the victim or their family was this girl's farm. And when you look on this with Google Earth, it's nothing but farm fields and some orchards. 
So the helicopter pilot is flying up to the scene using FLIR, not normal optics. They said it was pitch black, no moon. And they fly up to a scene and folks, here's the money shot. I've never seen this before. I'll probably never see it again. This is for you. This is the girl as seen on FLIR. When they fly up to her, she's laying on the ground prone, it looks like, on her face. The helicopter gets close, she stands up. Now, why is this important to me? Those were her shoes. She didn't have her shoes on. And she was asleep. As I've told you many times before, when the missing are found, they're either asleep or really groggy and don't remember anything. They never said what the girl stated. They never said what the girl, how the girl got there. They never stated anything other than they took her to the hospital after this. But finding the shoes off the girl was a monumental event in my world. So I wish there were more details, but there wasn't. But water was right nearby. Canines couldn't find a scent. Um, she didn't have her shoes on. Missing clothing, missing, missing shoes. I wish they would have said where the farm was. I wish it would have said what the farmer's last name was. But it's all we have. But it's enough to make it very interesting. Very interesting. Now. The next case I'm going to talk to you about, I can't say it's a 411 case, but I feel like I have a moral obligation to talk about this. And you're going to get an education about child abduction that you probably never would have had before. They have no idea what's happened to this boy, but we're going to take it from here. Michael Vaughn, five years old, missing July 27th of this year, sometime between 6.30 and 7. 7.15 at night. They're not quite sure, but that was the last time he was seen and he disappeared in that time span. From Fruitland, Idaho, right on the Oregon border. Uh, it's about 50 miles west of Boise. He was last seen on or very near 9th Street and Arizona Avenue on the southwestern side of Fruitland. Uh, so, he doesn't show up, he's missing, parents look for him, can't find him. They call Fruitland Police. And the first missing child alert goes out at 8.20 p.m. Good call by the police. Now, in a two hour time span, which 6.30 to 8.20, almost a two hour time span, somebody could drive 120 to 150 miles. And since it was on the Oregon border, they could be in Oregon, Washington, or Idaho. It's a long way to travel. But they didn't know what they had when they arrived. So the police immediately start searching and they start ramping up the efforts till eventually they search 29 miles of the Snake River Bank, which is nearby. 200 residences are questioned they described Michael as being smart and inquisitive. Parents are Tyler Vaughn and Brandy Neal. Fruitland is a very small police department, about 5,000 residents in the city. It's in Payette County, Idaho. They did a smart thing. They called the FBI right away. They didn't wait long. Well, in this incident, I can almost guarantee that the FBI summoned their Child Abduction Task Force. I know a little bit about this. I was part of that task force during the polyclass investigation. Uh, there was a sergeant at San Jose Police that knew the head of the task force. And when polyclass was abducted, he was summoned to be the head of that task force within a day. And he called the sergeant and said, hey, I need seasoned smart investigators right now and pick your best detective and bring them. Why don't you pick me? <laughs> I don't know. Whatever. And we went up there. And 
I met I met the task force lead, and he reminded me just like a, a detective sergeant at San Jose, which turns out that he had law enforcement experience before going to the FBI in a city. And he told us later on, he goes, I want cops that can talk street level with the most hardened criminals because the agents that he had there were super smart, bright guys. Didn't have the experience level of talking and talking street language with hardened criminals. Now, up to that time at San Jose, I'd worked a series of, of very proactive units. Uh, I worked a street crimes unit, I worked a SWAT team, I'd worked a lot of specialized units. On the SWAT team, sometimes we made three felony and you rust a night, every night for a week. I just put my handcuffs on three or four different felons every night and writing reports. Whereas an FBI agent may not put their handcuffs on somebody for a month or two months. And may never talk to somebody at a street level criminal like I would talk to daily at San Jose. Well, we got there and I started to see how the operation worked. And he was putting the pieces together of how the task force, task force managed itself. And I'm going to give you a little insight as to what's going on, I'm guessing, on Michael's case. Now, I truly don't know if the abduction task force is there. I'd say there's a 99% chance it is. Because since July 27th, uh, they don't have any new leads. They haven't found anything. But guaranteed that the police officers questioned everybody in that neighborhood. And what's different just in the last few years is most people have some type of camera now on their door. And you want to get that CCTV footage off that camera. And sometimes it can be the most innocuous thing that it could really break a case. So you want to get the cameras off every house within three miles. Because what if, the, what if the perpetrator parked a block away to do this? You don't know. Well, the other thing that investigators want to do is they want to pull every violent sex registrant, and I would do it within three miles. Let's look at that. So, on this side of the river, this side, is Fruitland, Idaho. On this side is Ontario, Oregon. The river is the state border. So here's the general area of the residence where Michael was last seen. This is the perimeter approximately of the three miles. So I went into the Department of Justice database on serious sexual offenders. Anybody can do this. And I would say that you should do it if you have young kids or you're thinking about moving into a new neighborhood, understand what you're moving into. Folks, in this area, three miles of this small city in Idaho that only has a population of 5,400, there are 20, 20 serious sexual offenders in that area. Okay? That's so why I'm a little, uh, little nervous about this case. They haven't found anything with Michael, and they've pulled out all the stops. They've done everything right. They had an Army helicopter come in with uh, FLIR, and they'd already started canvassing the neighborhood. They've done multiple searches. But let me kind of walk you through what the officers and the FBI agents do in a case like this. So first of all, the first officer on the scene obviously goes to the person who last saw the victim, missing person. What happened? What direction were they last going? What were they wearing? What was their attitude? What was their energy level? What was their age? Did they have any disabilities, illnesses? Really, what was the ability of that person to walk out of the area on their own and how long could they go? And what was their history of walking away or leaving or were they mad? Were they angry? Were they happy? Did they have any enemies? Well, if it was me, I wouldn't be there long before I'd be calling for the troops and I'd be wanting to get as many people there as possible, law enforcement. 
start searching the area. First of all, you search the house, and then a second officer searches the same house, and a third officer searches the same house. Why? Because the number of times kids have been missed in their own house is off the chart. Sleeping under a bed, behind a closet, it's bizarre. And then you want to search the ponds, and then you want to search the pools. Then you want to start knocking on neighbor's doors. And you want to keep track. And you, the officers need to write down the address of every neighbor's house they knock at. Were they home? If they aren't home, somebody comes back the next day. Then you want to write down the license plate of every vehicle in that neighborhood. You want to interview the people. Anything strange going on in this neighborhood lately? Then you want to ask the neighbors that you're interviewing, do you mind if I come in and search the house? Mind if I search the house with a canine? And you, you have that canine come in with the scent smell of the victim. And it's not to make the neighbor suspects, it's to clear them so you can move on and not even think about them anymore. And you slowly start moving outwards. I'd be calling for helicopters and drones right away. Just like the young girl we talked about in the United Kingdom that was found by a helicopter. Maybe they're just asleep in a field. And where Michael disappeared, there was a field, and there were fields right in his area that were searched extensively. About this time when I was coming up empty, I'd be calling detectives. And I'd ask for a, a detective or two to come out and help. I'd be also looking at my department's calls for service within a three mile radius of there. And I'd ask records to pull them all and give me a list. I want to know if there's any suspicious activity. Did somebody call a week earlier and say, yeah, someone was following my kid home and the kid didn't know him and they complained? Was there a suspicious car in the neighborhood? I'd want to see all of that. Did they have a license plate? All of that. And understand the calls for service, every one. I'd knock on every door within three miles eventually. And I'd be sitting down with the parent or the babysitter who last saw Michael. And when I got into it, and after the detectives got there, the detectives make a decision and the FBI makes a decision on whether to polygraph the parents or the babysitter, whoever those people were. And why, you ask? Because many, many times the parents or the babysitter are involved in the crime of getting rid of the child. As sad as that sounds. And you want to eliminate that. Now, I was on a case when I was a cop where almost this exact scenario that I've just described played out. And uh, one of the parents was given a polygraph. One of the questions on the polygraph of, have you committed a felony in the last week? Well, they narrowed the question down to that. And this person said, no. And they were lying on the polygraph. And it took two or three days for the polygraph examiner and the detectives. They were all over it thinking, oh, you know, something weird's going on. This guy or this lady might be guilty of something, blah, blah, blah. And finally they broke down and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was selling weed on the side to make a little extra money. And that's what I did. Had nothing to do with the missing person. But that threw a skew in the case for a couple days until he finally broke down and told the truth. But that's how weird it gets. In short, on a case like this, cops do not care about what kind of weed case you might be selling. They're focused on the missing person. Just tell the truth. Uh, so when the FBI gets there, they set up a series of computers and they start a running database. And that database includes everyone who's been contacted, every door that's been knocked on, every license plate that's written down, placed on a map. And as you are accumulating this data, it's going to profilers for the FBI. And the profilers sitting through, going through this, and eventually they will come out with a profile of who or what did this. So,
One of the other things that detectives and the FBI will be doing is calling state parole and county probation. So you commit a crime at a county level and you go on county probation. Well, I call a probation officer and explain, hey, we're working this in this area. Do you have any probationers that we should be interviewing that might possibly be doing something odd like this? Call state parole over the same issue and call in every, of the, every one of the agents about maybe they have a parolee that's at large, meaning they're wanted. I'd be looking at that. And in essence, you have to turn over every stone you can imagine. And I can guarantee you this, because I was there, that the energy level, the focus level of every law enforcement officer in that room is at a 10. About working overtime, nobody cares. Nobody cares how much overtime you work. Nobody cared about taking time off. Nobody cared about the anxiety outside of that world. Nobody cared. I was there when Polly Klaas's body was found. I can tell you that of the 50 agents and law enforcement officers in that room, there wasn't a dry eye. We had worked and they had committed themselves at such a high level trying to bring her back that when her body was found, it's like all of the energy out of you just poured out. And I never said that I understood what her parents went through, but my God, it was horrible. So I, I grew to truly admire Child Abduction Task Force on the FBI. One last thing I want to remember that I didn't include that you, that you really go after and interview hard is uh, postal delivery people, UPS drivers, uh, meter readers that read the meter, the people that are in the neighborhood that see things on a daily basis, often see things that most people wouldn't. And you'd go way out of your way to make sure those people were interviewed and talked to. Just see anything weird. So, this is Michael Vaughn. This is the wanted poster that Fruitland came out with. Really, really cute boy. I'm sure his parents are just destroyed at this point and can't even think and can't sleep and it's horrific so put that to memory really put it to memory if you live anywhere near fruitland on that idaho oregon border keep your eyes and ears open i would even say if you live within four or five hours of this case in this city keep your eyes and ears open hear anything strange some strange talk in a bar whatever Think of the FBI and call Fruitland Police. I realize it wasn't a 411 case. It could be, <laughs> but as of right now, I wouldn't say it is. I, I'd be handling it like an abduction. Uh, Snake River's close to his house. They've already searched that multiple, multiple times. But, you know, thank you for uh, being here. Thanks for being part of the village. Please make sure you're subscribed. Give a thumbs up if you like the video. Um, as we go through this, and as we do more videos, I'll, I'll start to educate you about more other things that are happening around you that you may never even know. And say an FBI agent or a police officer comes to your house someday and says, yeah, you know, we're interviewing the disappearance of a boy. You know, can we search your house? and we're not looking for any kind of criminal marijuana, anything. We're interested in just the child. Just let him in and let him search and get up behind you. Uh, there's no, no strange act that 
that is going on and nothing unusual happening. They just want to find the boy. So thanks for being here and uh, have a great week.